Hi, my name is Roy Rumbo. I'm an accounting professor at the University of North Texas. And this lecture is for my accounting 3120 Intermediate Accounting 2 students at UNT, but you know, published on uh, YouTube if somebody else uh, has interest, maybe in a deep sleep or whatever. Uh, I use the uh, McGraw-Hills Intermediate Accounting textbook uh, by Spiceland, Nelson Thomas, great book, highly uh, recommend that. So that, let me get started. We're gonna talk about uh, current liabilities um, and contingencies today. Uh, for University of North Texas, this is really the start of the intermediate accounting too. In intermediate accounting one, we went through the entire left side of the balance sheet, uh, you know, inventory, accounts receivable, property plan equipment, patents. So all ma mainly the asset side. And so now we're switching gears and we're going to be talking about, you know, liability, the liability side, equity, and some, you know, some more interesting subjects that we will we'll get to. So, you know, what is a liability? You know, let's just, you almost have to start there. You know, you think about the, the first people who wrote the accounting rules uh, in the accounting concepts that's still so published today, uh, which gets into um, what is a liability. Sometimes uh, you have some unusual situations in work, in, in business, very complex transactions or uh, product issues or whatever, and you have to kind of decide, you know, what is a liability. So, you know, I'll try to explain this slide in more layman's terms, maybe. Uh, so there's going to be some kind of future sacrifice. We're going to have to pay some money or do something in the future for something that has happened in the past and is a present current obligation. Uh, let me try to use some dates here to make it a little bit more specific. Let's say our year end, our accounting period ends on December 31st of whatever year. Well, we don't, we're closing the books in the month of January, maybe, you know, all the way out into February for some companies. And so that whole process, we're always thinking about, you know, December 31st, that's our balance sheet date. So anything that arises, some new knowledge of something that might be a liability, the first thing we got to think about, did this liability arise before December 31st? And are we got to pay something later? You know, it's not a liability if you never had to pay or do something because sometimes we receive cash and we have to do something for cash that we receive. And so, you know, we have to really clarify, uh, you know, when whatever triggered this liability happened. So that's why it's really important when this discussion of past transaction events, past means before the balance sheet date. So if something really bad happened, on January 10th, that's created a big liability for us. You know, maybe uh, one of our employees uh, had a, a big accident, hurt some people, and there's a big liability associated with that. If the accident happened in, in January 10th, well, we're not going to record that liability as of December 31st. So accounting, and I say this a lot, it's all about timing. Timing on the recognizing uh, that liability. By the way, when we credit a liability, a lot of times we're debiting an expense. And so uh, when we're thinking about these things in the accounting close process and thinking about what triggered these events, we're not just affecting the balance sheet. We may be affecting the profit and loss for the, uh, the company or corporation we're doing, um, doing this for. So um, now, one of these things, and in in, in I know you've heard this so many times between current assets and current liabilities, both in principles of accounting and intermediate one, but we're going to get in a little bit more depth here um, to talk about current liabilities. And the most important thing here, it's an obligation payable within one year or the firm's operating cycle, you know, uh, even if you have a longer operating cycle, most companies just use the one year, I'd like you to think about that. In, in terms of the one year standpoint. And why does it matter, you know, trying to clarify current versus long-term? Well, for the users of the financial statement, this might be really important, right? I wanna look as if I'm an investor looking at your company's financial statements, I wanna understand how much you gotta pay out in the next year. If I look at a long-term liability, you know, and you're generating cash, I may not be worried as less, but I wanna know 
I want to make sure I'm not investing in companies that are going to run into cash crunches or maybe even bankruptcy in the next few months. So you have a great company that doesn't have good liquidity. And so measuring and, and uh, recording and reporting the, these liabilities as current versus long time, long term really matters. Uh, some of the types of um, uh, liabilities that you know that are current to the current liabilities, accounts payable, notes payable, commercial payable, a lot of times the income tax liability, because we we'll have to calculate income tax expense and liability to December 31st. But as you know, we may not pay corporate taxes or due March 31st, or maybe get extended out into October. Uh, dividends are something that would be current uh, generally and um, accrued liabilities. And so, um, you know, we do not, you know, I just finished the time value of money chapter, you know, recording that for YouTube. We do not record current liabilities at their present value. So we don't take any interest component. Why? Because they're shorter term, they're gonna be paid within the year. So uh, we don't need to use any kind of time value of money uh, calculations. Accounts payable, I think you've seen this so many times in your, your accounting academic um, career here, and it's just the way of doing business. You know, just like accounts receivable from intermediate accounting one, you know, we are selling to our customers on terms, giving them time to pay us. That's just the way business works. Well, we're going to do the same thing for vendors, people that we're buying stuff from. Vendors, we're going to say, we're, we, we want to buy for vendors to give us um, you know, some terms, maybe 30 or 60 days so we can pay them later. Because it takes time, whatever we're buying, it takes time to build the inventory and sell the inventory, turn it into cash. And so we're always gonna be looking for terms from our vendors. And so um, now accounts payable are very short duration, like I said, 30 to 60 days, and there's no interest component. So we're not gonna to have to pay any interest on that. And that contrasts to notes payable, which are gonna be more formal, they're going to be there's going to be some kind of document associated with it, and it's going to be longer duration, and it's going to bear interest. I'm just going to do one quick check here, guys, to make sure I'm recording this meeting. I think I did this in the last. It is recording, so let me share my screen back again. I do not want to have to repeat this lecture again, so I th I'm going to have to do a better job of remembering this because I think I did this the last time I was, in my last lecture I recorded. All right. So uh, short-term notes payable, you know, uh, there could be, uh, you know, less than a year. So we're at the notes payable can be a lot shorter term, certainly than a bonds payable. So we'll have to, you know, if, if we're in a company, understand is this note due in, in, the, for, in the next year? And if it's an 18-month note, not due for a while, we will, you know, not have to, to worry about it as much. And then some companies uh, use credit lines. I know at Linux and at Maytag, we had a, a very large credit line. I think at Linux where I worked, I think when I left there, that credit line was about seven or $800 million. And I would compare a credit line to uh, maybe something you're more familiar with, with your credit card, you know? And so maybe you have a, you're authorized a, a credit card limit, maybe it's 10,000, but you don't go use the whole, time. hopefully you're not maxing out, you, you know, when you max out your credit card, that means you're borrowing every dollar that is allowed up to the limit. So, you know, for companies, they, they don't use credit cards because they wouldn't be enough, you know, for 700, if you imagine a $700 million credit card, they use what's called credit lines. And a credit line allows them to go out and tap that credit line and borrow money whenever they need it or pay it back as they need it. So, I think Linux had a seven or eight hundred million dollar credit line, but at any point in time, only three or four hundred million might have been outstanding. And so, with a committed uh, credit line, uh, the bank is is pretty much guaranteed that you're going to be able to borrow that money. There's a for Linux, there was a consortium of about fifteen or twenty banks that stood stood behind it and and worked together to give us that seven or eight hundred million. And so. When there's a committed credit line, a lot of times there'll be a, a fee associated with that, whether you use it or not, you know, because it's always uh, available to you. 
And I, I thought it was interesting in the middle of COVID, when COVID first started hitting, and companies thought they might start having some cash crunches, they immediately went in and tapped all of their credit lines. You saw a lot of people tapping their credit line almost 100% to be able to weather the storm of COVID. And banks um, couldn't say no to that because they already had a commitment, a formal commitment. With an informal amount, you may be able to uh, uh, you know, get a prearranged loan without all the formal documentation, but uh, it's not committed. So they, there may be a little more challenge to be able to, to get that money. But again, if it's a committed credit line, you know, the company's paying a fee to the bank. Uh, so they better not uh, you know, say no, regardless of the economic circumstances. So interest, as I always like to say, is the uh, cost of using someone else's money or the income for someone using your money. And so interest, in this case, we're in the liability side of, of our course here, intermediate accounting. And so we're gonna be talking about interest being paid. Um, and it's just the, the base amount times the percentage, the interest rate, that's always stated as an annual rate times the time to maturity, what's maturity when it's finally going to get paid. So let's look at uh, a notes payable here. And so this uh, affiliated technologies borrowed $700,000 in cash. It was a formal note payable. It was a six month note with a 12% um, interest rate. And so um, the company received, you know, cash inflow of $700,000 and they signed a note. So the bank had, on the bank side, um, they had a note receivable. You know, we as a company had a note payable, the bank had a note receivable. And at the end, at the end of the six months, uh, the company is gonna pay, uh, pay back the note and they're gonna incur interest. So that was a 12% annual rate. It was outstanding for six months. Every day it's outstanding, there's an interest cost. So, you know, six months out of the 12 month rate, ends up in 42,000. So we have interest expense of 42,000. And um, you know, we're gonna debit that as an expense and debit uh, the note payable and credit cash. So we're gonna pay 742,000. Keep in mind, you know, back to your debits and credits, when we create this notes payable, uh, we're increasing our liabilities with a $700,000 credit. When we pay it back, we reduce that notes payable with a debit. Just want to keep you in line there as we go through this. Accrued liabilities are for expenses that many times they're going to be kind of estimated expenses, not as clear. And uh, we record those as adjusting entries. Remember uh, the beginning of intermediate accounting one and back to principles of accounting at the end of the accounting period. You know, if we use that December 31st example, I used earlier, during the January accounting close process, we're gonna go through and do adjusting entries. We're gonna find out all the things that were liabilities at December 31st. Maybe we haven't paid our employees, but they did work for us. So we're gonna to have to credit salaries payable and debit salaries expense. We may have income tax payable, we may have some interest payable. We'll look at those calculations. And here we go. Um, accrued interest. And so here's a note that was a, again, same six month note, 12% uh, um, interest rate, 700,000. So the same thing. And, um, but here's the issue this time. It's going to cross over this note, it's going to cross over an accounting period in. And so the note was issued on May 1. The company got 700,000 credit notes payable but we've got an adjusting entry. Why? Because on June 30th, we've got to go create our annual financial statements. Their fiscal period ends on June 30th. And so what's happened here? This note, we've been, this company has been using that $700,000 for two months. So what did they incur? Interest costs, but they don't pay it until the end of the six months. Well, that's not good enough. We're gonna to have to recognize that liability for interest and that expense for interest at the end of the period. And so we're gonna say, credit the interest payable and in debit interest expense, 700,000 times 
or two divided by 12. Why is it two? It's been outstanding for May and June. And why do we divide by 12? The rate is a 12 month rate. So the interest expense is calculated 700,000 times the 12 month rate times two divided by 12, 14,000. Now we're not done yet because uh, you know the, uh, the, the note is gonna be paid off November one. And so we have that same entry we saw before, we have to pay 742, but this time, we not only have the note payable liability that we're gonna get rid of with a debit, we've got this interest payable we set up in the last slide. Uh, at the end of June 30th, we set up an interest payable and now we have paid that interest payable. And so uh, we're gonna take that down. And then the remaining 742 minus the 714, 28,000 is interest expense for the four months in the next accounting period. So think about how this interest expense, we put 14,000 of the 42 in the June 30th income statement and the other 28,000 got put into the next year's in income statement. So that's where, you know, if we had not done this entry here, this adjusting entry, our interest expense would have been wrong at June 30th. It would have been wrong for the next year. We'd have put the whole 42 in the next year. And so the adjusting entry gets the income statement right, but it also gets the balance sheet right. Because if that note had been called, if it could have been called, and that day, June 30th, we would have owed uh, 700,000 plus the $14,000 of interest that had been outstanding for two months. By the way, these entries and any accounting test you have on this, this chapter, you're going to have to know these three entries. The first, receipt of cash. The second one, the pool of interest uh, over an account at the end of any accounting period that's in the middle of the term of this note. And then the final entry, the final payment for that note. I don't care what accounting class you're in across the country, you're gonna to need to know that for sure. It's, it's kind of simple, there's only three entries and there's, you know, get to the logic, understand the logic. Now, there's a lot of things that our employees receive besides just salaries, you know, Number one, vacation. <laughs> you know, I, that's the one thing I always wanted to negotiate when I started with a new company. I really you know, didn't want to negotiate pay. I just was not good at that because you know, I feel like if I work hard, they'll take care of me later. But once vacation is set, it's over. You know, the HR department doesn't really allow that to change. So um, I always tried to negotiate, understand the vacation policy because that mattered to me. Especially for accountants, we work a lot of hours, so it's, it's pretty important to understand, you know, we're going to need those vacation days. <laughs> and, uh, and so guess what, you know, um, we're going to have to calculate potentially a vacation liability. So uh, generally what happens if, um, if, if I earn vacation this year, let's just use 2022 for an example. If I earn two weeks of vacation, uh, through this year, and I'm just too busy, I don't take it. And on December 31st, I've earned two weeks of vacation. Can I roll that over to the next year and take it in 2023? And many companies, not all, the answer is yes. You know, we'll allow you to accrue and take your vacation in the next year that you earned in a prior year. Well, guess what? In accounting, we've got to recognize that liability at the end of the year, for all the vacation that's outstanding that all of our employees could take next year. Not easy. Um, in some of my companies, we tracked vacation and uh, there was pretty cool systems that, for example, at Maytag, we always knew, um, every employee knew how many hours they've earned minus how many they've taken. And so it was like continuous rollover. And you could not roll over uh, more than five weeks. So if you got to five weeks of vacation earned, you had to start taking it or you'd lose it. And so that way uh, for the accountants, we could just add up all the hours owed in that system 
and we could calculate the vacation liability at any point in time, at any month, at any end of any quarter. Now, there are some companies that have it, what's called, I call it, take it or lose it. We're giving you two weeks of vacation for 2022. You get to December 31st, you have not used it, it's gone. You know, you know that is the way Linux operated. You know, it was a take it or lose it company. So we had no vacation approval at the end of the year, zero. And so as accountants, we, you know, we're not allowed to just put our head in the sand. We've got to go understand, hey, what is the vacation policy? We've got to understand that. And, and sick days would be the same there. If there were sick days that could be rolled over to the next year, then we've got to be able to calculate that. Now, um, to accrue that, here's the four rules. But the number one is, I get to number two, can that vacation be rolled over? Do At the end of any accounting period, do we owe our employees vacation? And um, obviously, it has to be related to services that have already been performed. Go back to the definition of a liability. Payment is probable. Well, most of the time, it is going to definitely be probable. Employees are going to use their vacation, and we can estimate it. And you know, we know we should know how many hours um, are, are due our employees for vacation, and we know how much they make per hour. So, it should normally be easily uh, estimated. Another thing, now not all employees in companies I work receive bonuses, but um, executives and even usually down even to a manager level, uh, employees got bonuses. Where I worked at Maytag, every salaried employee got a bonus and it was based on results. It was based on um, income and sometimes on cash flow as well, the combination of both net income and cash flow, employees could earn a bonus. Now. Uh, generally, just to understand bonuses, lower level em employees will earn, you know, a less percent of their salary and higher level employees will, you know, be a higher percent of their salaries. For example, uh, Maytag's the best. All salaried employees could receive a bonus equal to 5% of their annual salary. But the CEO, I think it went up to 100 or 200% of his salary. And I think I was in that like 40 to 50% range. What was really cool about that was why do companies do this? They were all aligned. The financial measurements were exactly the same for the lowest level or the highest level employee. So we're all aligned around these financial measurements. Everyone's trying to drive uh, to good financial results. Everybody's on the page because we all want that bonus you know, at the end of the year. So it's, it's highly motivational. Now, here is what's hard. Uh, let's see what the next slide is going to say. No, uh, here's what's hard about an annual bonus. Yes, at the end of the year, it's easy to know. We know what our financial results are, and we can calculate it. We can record a bonus payable, you know, because that's not going to be paid until all, all the financials are done that we really know and audited. We want to base and pay these bonuses based on audited results. No one's cooking the books or anything. So they're never going to be paid before year end or paid after year end. The, the hard part was during the year uh, because, you know, all public companies have to do quarterly financials. So you think about you get through the first quarter of the year and maybe it's good or bad, but, you know, one quarter doesn't make a full year. So you're trying in the end of the first quarter to calculate your bonus payable for the year, your 25 percent of it through the first quarter. You're trying to kind of guesstimate, hey, where are we going to be at the end of the year? How much is the bonus going to be paid? And uh, so you have to kind of estimate that al along the way. Okay, now we get into you know, more, if you remember deferred revenues, um, we are going to receive money from our customers and we're gonna owe them stuff. And there's a lot of different ways uh, we could get money. You know, we could get a deposit in advance from customers, you know, um, the, the best example to me is the airline. We're giving the airline advances, you know, so that we can fly a plane two, three, four months from now. And so uh, that that is, you know, what I call deferred deferred revenue piece. We could sell gift cards. You know, think about it. When you sell a gift card, we'll get into it in a future slide. But 
have you done anything yet? You just sold a gift card. That's not a revenue yet. So when a company brings that gift card to your restaurant or wherever you are, you owe them a meal, you owe them clothing, whatever the gift card was for. And so the companies are, are receiving cash for these gift cards, but they have a liability to owe you whatever that they sell you know, for that. And then we'll get into collections from third parties and governments and things like that. So advances from customers, you know, we may pay it upfront. You know, we don't have magazines so much anymore, but um, you know, I do pay, I do, I'm a prime member of Amazon. So I give them an annual, I don't even know what it is these days, like 200 bucks. And through that prime membership, I get free shipping. I get all these things. So that's another, they got an advanced payment from me. And so they, they can't just count that as revenue. They're going to have to count that as a liability back to me to give me all the special stuff that I get from the prime mem membership. And um, I'm sure you remember deferred revenue. So here is a company that um, sold subscriptions for $20 million and they get the cash up front, debit cash. So this is an entry you're really going to need to know and credit deferred revenue. And it's always confusing for students because they see the word revenue and they forget to see the word deferred, meaning later, you know? So deferred revenue is not an income statement account. It's deferred revenue. I am receiving money for future revenue transactions. I'm gonna to have to do something in the future. If I have a uh, responsibility to do something in the future, what does that sound like? That's an obligation. What's an obligation? That's a liability. So deferred revenue is, uh, in this case, $20 million liability. What do they owe? Well, they owe uh, providing these subscriptions magazines uh, for the next um, whatever, you know, maybe it's a 12 month. I don't know what it was, 12 months. Now, when the magazines are delivered or when we fly on the airline, now we can, the companies can count that as revenue, credit to revenue on the income statement. And what is this? This is a debit to what? A liability account. So we remember debits and credits. Deferred revenue is a liability set, account set up as a credit. And then we reduce that as we give them whatever we owed them, in this case, magazine subscriptions. Think about it from an airline. They take and debit cash for the money we give them and they have deferred revenue for an airline flight. They owe us an airline flight. They don't, if we show up at a gate, they don't know who we are. We're not gonna be happy, you know, we're gonna be pissed and because they owe us that flight. And, uh, and they've done nothing when they receive our cash. They haven't flown us anywhere. They just take in our cash and reserved us on a flight somewhere. When they fly us, now they can have revenue, credit their revenue and debit deferred revenue. If you think about American Airlines or Southwest or United Airlines, they have you know, millions, and millions, maybe billions of dollars in deferred revenue. They're taking up a lot of cash uh, ahead of, of the flight. Now, gift cards become a little bit interesting because uh, it's kind of crazy, and maybe you can you understand this, but a lot of people don't use their gift cards. I get gift cards for my birthday, for Christmas, and then I give them to, I know it's bad because it's so easy to just give people gift cards. But sometimes I got like uh, 20 different gift cards, you know, they, they, they sitting at my desk over time, and I think that was one year I said, I told my wife, we're just going to take these gift cards. And we're going to eat at all these restaurants until these are gone. You know, but some people don't get to it. They lose the card or whatever. So there's some breakage. And so um, we're going to have to consider, you know, what percent of our gift cards will not be used? And it's going to lower uh, the cost of that. And so we'll, we'll get into that gift card later, I think so. And so we may have collections for, for third parties. Um, let me just talk about that breakage for a minute. And I'm, I know that we'll get to another slide later, but what happens with that, if we have a 5% break, let's say we have a $100 gift, gift cards, and we know that 5% of them will never be used, then we're gonna reduce that liability by, by that 5% and reduce the expense by 5%. So gift cards are a really good thing for businesses. 
Consumer rebates are the, exactly the same thing. And you know, we use a lot of consumer rebates uh, for appliances when I work with Maytag. And the breakage rate was, was pretty high. Even for a $100 rebate, the breakage rate could be about 20%. I couldn't imagine it, maybe because I'm a cheap accountant, how would you get a hundred dollar gift certificate and not and go, uh, you know, take a, a consumer rebate and not fill out all the paperwork and get that back? And I think the problem is there's a lot of paperwork, and some some people just like screw it, I'm just going to forget about. But it's a hundred bucks, and we had a twenty percent breakage rate, so a hundred dollar consumer rebate only cost us eighty bucks in expense and eighty dollars in a liability. That's pretty wild. To get there, you have to have a lot of data. You have to confirm it for yourself and for your auditors. Okay, now a lot of times we're going to collect uh, things from our customers, definitely from our employees. And um, you know, some examples are withholding taxes. You know, if you look at your paycheck, I'll come back here. If you look at your paycheck, uh, I know my son. We got his first paycheck. But what the heck? <laughs> you know, I made twelve bucks an hour, and I work these hours. Why am I not getting all this? Well, they're withholding a whole bunch of stuff. Now let's think about that for a minute. So just look at withholding um, for uh, US income taxes. Maybe they, they take 10% of your checkout. That's, that's not, so let's say you may have a $1,000 paycheck and there's $100 withheld, you only get 900. Did the company only have $900 of expense? No, they had a thousand dollars expense. They collected that hundred from your paycheck. They reduced your check by hundred, and they have to give it to the U.S. government. So, what does that create? A liability for the company. And so, these withholding taxes and anything that's withheld from your paycheck becomes a liability for the company to pay somebody else. In other words, basically, companies are the collection agents for the U.S. government. Uh, for taxes. Let's think about sales taxes here. Um, you know, uh, same thing with sales tax, like, like payroll withholding, it's the same thing. You know, so let's say uh, the, the company, uh, let's say Target, I think they use an example. Target sells something for a hundred bucks. Uh, well, they're gonna collect sales tax for that. There's a lot more here in tax, Texas because it's eight and a quarter percent but let's just call it seven. So they're gonna collect $107. Did the company have revenue of 107? No, they took an extra seven bucks from you at the counter in sales taxes. And now they have to go out and they have to give that back to whatever county, whatever state where they collected that. Again, they're operating like a collection agent um, collecting those sales taxes um, for um, the government. And if you're in a company, you know, in all the companies I work, it seemed like the sales tax auditors uh, were in there from every state, you know, overlooking our books to make sure, have you taken all these things? Number one, are you collecting the right sales tax from everybody? And then are you paying us everything you collected? You can't keep any in the back, backside for yourself. That would be illegal. That would be fraud. And so uh, all the states uh, and many times counties will have sales tax auditors. And um, that's another, hey, job security for us as accountants. Uh, that would be kind of an interesting job. So switching gears here, uh, let's talk about current versus long-term non-current classification. And, you know, this is really important. I mean, the income statement is important. If you missed and accrual and your income statement is wrong, that's a big deal. But, you know, sometimes you could miss the current portion of a longer term debt. For example, look at this here. Let's say this is a 20 year bond. You know, 20 years ago, the company went out and issued a bond for 20 years. For 19 years, it's sitting in long term liabilities. But in the 20th year, you, it's due within one year. So it's not long-term anymore. You've got to move it into the current liabilities, usually called current maturities of long-term debt. Well, think about the poor accountants who've been tracking this. Maybe there's someone who's been working there a long time 
always putting in long-term debt every year, every year for 19 years. And suddenly things change and they forget. Well, that would be a, a significant error. And in one of my companies, one time we missed, uh, we we're doing the June financial statements and one of our long-term debt pieces, $40 million tranche, was gonna come due the next June. Well, we missed it. Now, fortunately, the financial statements were right because the auditors found it. Now, having said that, it was not fun for me uh, because I had an error and I had to explain to the audit committee, you know, what happened to our internal controls? How did you miss this $40 million? How did you make this mistake? That was not a fun experience for me. And so this is one I told my staff, we have got to track all this long-term debt and we've got to be thinking what's due in the next 12 months. You're doing that June financial statement or September financial statement or December financial statement. You've got to think ahead for the next 12 months and make sure you put the right amount into um, current. Now, by the way, total liability wouldn't have been wrong because I still had that long-term debt sitting in the non-current portion. But the, the uh, share of it that should have been in current was wrong. And that matters. And so if you, if you miss a current versus a non-current liability classification, it's a big deal. And so if you're going to be a future auditor, you're going to want to be looking at that. So there are some, some nuances here for sure. If you uh, obligation callable by the creditor, um, if debt that is callable in the next year, maybe the, the uh, callable means that the debtor could say, hey, you need to pay me now. I don't, I don't want to wait till the end of the 20 years. Pay me now, year 14. If they have that option and some debt allows that option for the creditor, then I've got to put that in current because they, they maybe we don't think they're going to call it. Maybe they're not even going to call it, but they have that option. That debt becomes a current. And so you really have to think through all of these things um, uh, to understand this. And maybe there are, are debt covenants that you might fail that makes the debt callable. All debt agreements have some kind of debt covenants that you have to have certain current assets and different um, income levels and different debt ratios and all of that. And so if you miss one of those, maybe the debt's callable right now. So this current versus non-current classification for liabilities is, a, is I've always experienced that to be a great challenge. because You've got to really understand all the nuances of all your credit agreements to make sure you get uh, all of these classified correct. And here's another one. This is uh, even crazier. You know, maybe we have a short-term obligation, but we're planning to refinance it so it'll become a long-term obligation. Well, you can call it long-term as long as if you've done these two things. You intend to finance it on a long-term basis and you have the ability to do it. Now, there's another piece uh, here that's just a, like a big kicker at the end. You can say, yeah, I intend to do it and we definitely have the financial wherewithal to do it, but uh, that's not good enough if you don't have a refinancing agreement in place. Uh, you, you are allowed to go past just the year end date, like the December 31st date, and before the financial statements are issued, which might be in February or something. And so um, as long as you have it done before your financial statements are issued, that refinancing agreement is in place, then you can move it from current into uh, long non-current liabilities. Lots of stuff here. You know, a lot of, you get into uh, both liabilities and equities, we'll see later in the course, there's a lot of nuances and you know why there's a lot of complexity in, in the type of arrangements that our companies are doing um, with our banks or you know, in the public markets. And so it's very, a lot of uh, very creative type financing arrangements that we have to understand and account for correctly. Now, we're kind of changing gears here to what's called a loss contingency. A loss contingency um, comes about, and I, I just really 
focus on this word uncertain. We have a potential loss, but we don't know if it's going to be a real loss or not. Um, my, I have so much experience with these, I could tell you stories. Uh, they're all painful stories because usually loss contingencies uh, end up, with, there's lots of money involved. Um, you know, uh, generally uh, with a class action lawsuit, um, that's where a lot of these come about. Uh, in the appliance industry, if you have a recall, um, you know, that's with the Consumer Protection Agency, there's uh, um, some, some rules around this, some laws, consumer protection laws around this, that if your product um, it could hurt somebody or be damaged, you got to do a recall. There's just no question about it. And, or if there's something, an issue uh, with it in this way it's not working, but you may have to do a formal recall. You, you may see this if you own an automobile, many times you go find out, you got to take the dealer, they fix it for free. And that, that's good for you, but think about it from the company standpoint. Uh, and here's the issue. Um, these things kind of have a lifespan. So we may get some noise in the system. And this is like almost a real circumstance for me back um, at Maytag. We um, got it, you know, we, we heard some noise in the field that one of our dishwashers, a few of our dishwashers were creating fires uh, in housing, houses. Well, that's serious. And so we researched it. We were at a a uh, high deal of integrity at Maytag. We really took that to heart, uh, but we could never figure out were these fires actually created by the dishwasher or by something else in the home. And so there was some noise uh, that we may have a problem. So, well, what do you do? Do I have a liability uh, to go fix this? We had determined, by the way, that if these were creating fires, we knew exactly which kind of uh, models and products it might be, it would have been 40 million, um, you know, cost to go fix that. Here's the question. Do I have a liability of 40 million? I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. I don't even know if that fire was created by our dishwasher. And so we, you know, I was the uh, chief accounting officer, corporate controller, spent a lot of time with our general counsel, and with our engineers, with our operation, a lot of people in the room talking about this, is this an issue or not an issue? And so, by the way, this one turned out to be not an issue. We never paid, it was created by something else. There were other product uh, issues uh, with, you know, washing machines and other things that were over hundred million. So we're not talking about small dollars here. If you've got a product with a problem that's in, consumers' homes all over the United States or maybe all over the world for some companies, you know, it, these are big deals. These are big costs. And so when do we record the liability for these? It's hard because guess what? We don't know what is going to happen. So here are the rules for this. You've got to determine uh, two things. What's the likelihood? What's the probability that uh, we're going to have that recall, the, the bad thing that's going to happen. That's question one. Question two, can we even calculate how much uh, this would be? There's another issue at, at Linux with um, uh, some bad coding from our vendor, by the way, not from us. And it was uh, creating problems for uh, eight heating and air, condition, air conditioning units that were uh, subject to salt water, salt air. Well, where are these located? You know, we don't even know how many we've sold that are installed right next to the ocean. Is it right next to the ocean? Is it 10 miles from the ocean? Is it 50 miles? We don't know. And so there's a, a whole, sometimes it's not that easy to determine <clears throat> the amount of the loss. So here are the rules. If it's, you, we got to, here, let, let's, I'm going to get to the rules in a second. Number one, we got to, determine this likelihood. Is it probable, likely to occur? Is it reasonably possible? The chance will occur is more than remote, but less than likely. They don't have percentages on these, you know? And I don't think you could put percentages on it. I think some of the accounting firms like to think it's around 75% equals probable, but the rules do not give you any percent. You just have to think about it with, uh, you know, common sense. Or is it remote? 
yeah, uh, it's very remote chance that this is going to be a problem, that we're going to have a cash, cash outlet for it. So that's getting back to the likelihood. So here's the rules now. If the amount is probable, um, you know, um, likelihood's probable, and we can estimate the dollar value. So this is a really uh, complicated table, I know. But OK, let's just say it this way. If it's probable and we can calculate the loss, we are going to record the liability. So if it's probable, we record the liability. And we can estimate the loss. So if it's probable and it's either known or we can reasonably estimate the loss, we record the liability. If it's probable and we can't estimate it, we record nothing, but we have a disclosure note. I remember looking at the annual report for Philip Morris cigarettes. And at that point, this is back, you know, way back when I, I was in Vermont at the time, so late, late 1990s. And uh, at that time, cigarette companies were paying billions and billions of dollars of settlements uh, to state governments in lawsuits because of the cancer causing agent within cigarettes. And Philip Morris, so I was looking at the, I owned Philip Morris stock at the time, I was looking at it, and it, they had not recorded one dollar of liability, even though they were being sued, <laughs> like all the other companies all over. And so I realized that balance sheet is missing, you know, maybe four or five billion dollars of liability. They didn't record it. They said, it's probable we're going to have to pay something. We don't know how much. We can estimate it. I personally thought that was the biggest BS in the world because you can look at what other companies are paying. I think they could have known that. I sold the stock the next day. Part of it was they're missing this big liability. Part of it is, man, come on. That's, I didn't feel like that was a full, uh, you know, full integrity. So if you're working for Philip Morris and you're listening to this, I'm sorry, but that was you know, my personal opinion at the time. So you see how important it is to go read these footnotes because in that case with Philip Morris, they disclosed it because it was probable, but they couldn't estimate it. And they said that, said we cannot estimate this, but it could be big. <laughs> and, uh, now, second level, if it's reasonably possible, it's disclosure note only, regardless of whether you can estimate the loss or not. So you do have to disclose that usually in something called a contingent liability footnote. So if you want to invest in a company, it might be smart of you to look at these contingent liability footnotes because there might be a lot of bad things in there that could affect the future of whatever company you want to invest in. Maybe you want to know that before you invest in the company. And then if it's remote, do nothing, nothing required. So keep, keep in mind, Likelihood, amount of the loss. The amount, being able to estimate the loss only comes into play if it's probable. But if you can't estimate, then you're just in the same boat as the reasonably possible. Unfortunately, um, I always tell my students, you know, try to learn the logic behind all these and you'll remember it. This is one uh, pretty much you've just got to memorize. A special um, kind, type of loss contingency will, you will, B is a warranty because companies sell products with warranties. You know, if you buy a car these days, uh, you can get, um, I got I to gotta close this off. Uh, if you, some, some warrant, some, I'm back to a car. You buy a car these days, you receive a warranty, usually 50,000 miles or three years, whatever comes first. And so, I like you to think about that from the car company standpoint. When you buy that car with that 50,000 mile warranty on that car, they now have a liability to you, right? They have got to fix every possible problem that might come up during your warranty period. Well, this is also a, a loss contingency. And by the way, these car companies, all the companies I work for, we had a lot of warranties. We had so much data we knew um, pretty much what percent of these are going to break down, you know, and we actually even knew 
kind of exactly what kind of problems might happen. And so we had to accrue that expense. Now, um, before I talk about this, this slide, here's an example. I want you to remember one thing, if nothing else around warranties, there's timing. Everybody misses this on exam. When you record a warranty expense, you record it, it's matching. You record it with the revenue. So when that car company sells a car with a warranty, they're recording revenue. We have to record the expense. We want to match that expense. You know, a couple of reasons why. Number one, that's part of the expense. That, you, you couldn't have sold that car without providing a warranty. That warranty is part, is really like cost of goods sold. It's matching just as, as much as possible. And if you didn't record that warranty expense with that revenue, man, you would have overstated uh, income. So that'd be kind of point one. Point two, once you drive that car off the lot and you bought it, that's the day the liability starts. It doesn't start later, a month later. It starts the day you sign that contract and drive that car off the lot. From that day, that company owes you a warranty. And so the day you drive off the lot, that's when revenues are reported too, right? And so that's where the liability starts. That's where the expense is reported. And we record all the estimated future costs on that day. Not when we actually have to fix it. Because we're going to estimate all that up front. So let's look at an example now. So, um, so Caldor Health sells healthcare products, and they have experience that they're going to have 7% of their products are going to have problems. 3% in the first 12 months and 4% in the next 12 months. And um, during December 18, uh, the first month of availability, Caldor sold $2 million worth of chairs. And so here's the revenue, uh, December revenue, uh, received $2 million of cash or receivables, and we recorded revenue. So what do we got to record? We've got to record warranty in December. If these revenues happen in December, we've got to record the warranty expense in December, adjusting entry. So we're going to debit $140,000 warranty expense and create the liability as of December 31st. And so that was the 7% times the 2 million based on historical experience. Now we set this liability up with the credit, right? Back to your debits and credits. When do we debit that? We debit it when we actually have actual claims and costs. And so we will reduce that liability when we're paying for those claims. We, we've already recorded the full warranty expense for the future. So we will debit the warranty liability, we won't debit expense. So again, this is accrual-based accounting, not cash-based accounting. So we record warranty expense based on timing with the revenue, not when we're actually gonna do the warranty claims. So the warranty claims are, are be off kilter. That's later, after we've already reported the revenue. And so uh, this it's important uh, to think through this. Now, our warranty estimate of 7%, this, I always get this question when I teach this, uh, could be wrong. And so we'll have to make some adjustments down the road as we see how claims are coming in. And it could be an adjustment uh, to the liability and to the expense. So if our warranty percent becomes only 5%, we do better, but you had better quality than we anticipated, then we're gonna, we're gonna reduce that liability and it would be you know, kind of income, but that would be later based on an estimate. Now, extended warranty uh, contracts are different. And so this is outside of the normal warranty. They must be really profitable because everybody, they, we're all getting uh, the extended warranty phone calls right now that you know, I don't think they'd be making, uh, calling us uh, 20 times a week if there wasn't some value in an extended warranty. So extended warranty outside of the normal warranty. So if a car manufacturer's normal warranty is 50,000 miles, the extended warranty could take it to two hundred thousand miles or whatever. This is separate. This is not recorded at the time of the revenue. The normal warranty is recorded with the revenue. This is really, uh, uh, you know, a separate item. We'll, we'll create that uh, as a separate uh, warranty liability, and um, you know, almost this be almost like deferred revenue in that case.
So I talked about the disclosure of litigation dependencies. Uh, and you can look at this in your, of course, I'm not going to read this whole thing again, but um, usually uh, when you have, again, uh, reasonably possible or um, probable, but I can't estimate it, I've got to disclose it. You got to give enough disclosure uh, to provide enough information for an investor to make a, a decision of how this might turn out in the future. I'm going to skip by that. Gain contingencies. Here's uh, we are very conservative in accounting, so we record losses, you know, future projected losses, but not future projected gains. So. This is, as they say, an example of conservatism. I do struggle with this. I don't know why you wouldn't have the same rules on both sides, because if it's probable that I know, uh, maybe you know, I bought, our company bought some bad products for resale and the, the vendor owes us for those. We know we've sued them, you know, just like we get sued, we sue our vendors as well. And we know it's probable they've agreed to pay us but a lot of times uh, it's called a gain contingency and you don't record it to actually receive the cash. And I think the problem I guess for the FASB or the rule makers is they don't want a lot of people recording all these gains, then they don't happen. They have to reverse them as losses later. And so there could be create some volatility in the financial statement. So gain contingencies, cash basis. Loss contingency, no, we approve a loss contingency if it's probable and it can be estimated. Uh, so payroll liabilities. So we have a legal requirement to withhold taxes from our employees. And so we are going to, uh, um, you know, uh, in this case, we're not going to debit expense, not our expense, right? It's employees. So we'll, you know, we'll credit cash. We'll debit salary expense. Let's say, let's say we have that $1,000 check. We'll debit $1,000 salary expense. We employ our employees 800. So credit 800 in cash. This other 200, those are all liabilities, either federal withholding or state withholding or social security, all that, those are deductions. And those become liabilities that we set up um, when we cut, when we withhold from our employees. And then later we'll pay the, the governments and we'll reduce those. And so just like any other kind of accrued liability. And my friends, that is it uh, for, this chapter, and I will work uh, just a few problems. This chapter doesn't lend itself to as, as many kind of problems, but I will be working a few problems in this chapter uh, here uh, in the next lecture for chapter 13. This is lecture 13A, and then 13B, I will work problems. Thank you, guys. Hope you have a good uh, evening or uh, whatever it is you're doing right now.